Okay, good afternoon. We're Team Epsilon. I'm Jessica Lynn. I'm Rob Pinson. I'm Jeffrey Denault. And our teammate Ramon Onorog uh, had an emergency and couldn't be here with us this afternoon. So today we're talking about Lionsgate. Specifically, we're pitching a buy for Lionsgate's 5 and 7 8 senior unsecured note, which is coming due in November of 2024. Um, this note is currently trading at a spread of 442 basis points. We believe this can tighten to a target spread of 265 basis points with an upside of about 180 points. We believe that there's significant buying opportunity for Lionsgate and that recent company performance and a negative watch announcement associated with the streaming wars has resulted in the market over penalizing the company. We'll talk more about this um, throughout our presentation, but we do believe that management has an opportunity to divest a portion of STARS, which is their streaming platform. We expect Lionsgate to continue to perform in its bedrock lines, lines of business, which are film and TV production and distribution. So today we'll talk a little bit about the company, um, the industry, the catalyst event that I just mentioned, uh, review our implied credit spread and scenario analysis, and then close with our summary and recommendation. So what does Lionsgate do? Lionsgate is an entertainment uh, company that's based here in Los Angeles, engaged in motion picture, production, distribution, television, um, interactive ventures and games and digital platforms, both domestically and internationally. Um, as you can see, they have a number of key success drivers with an acquisition of a large library, 17,000 titles, plus production in film and TV and their streaming service. Lionsgate has three major lines of business with motion picture being their largest line of business, where Lionsgate operates as a mini major studio and has production and distribution channels domestically and internationally. They've signaled major franchise films coming down the pipeline with Hunger Games prequel and the expansion of the John Wick universe. Their next largest line of business is TV production where they create content. They have about 65 projects underway and significant IP associated with these projects. And Lionsgate has positioned itself very uniquely here um, being platform agnostic. So the content that they create can be displayed across different streaming networks. Finally, they have their media network, uh, which is largely that STARS platform that I mentioned earlier. This was acquired in 2016 um, and is positioned as an add-on over the top service that's live in 51 markets. So looking at the industry overall, the entertainment industry, you see some growth over the past couple of years, with 2018 actually being the highest domestic box office on record. Um, the international market is growing as well, with growth um, across theatrical and digital home entertainment. So now looking to Lionsgate's current capital structure, Lionsgate has about $3 billion in long-term debt. Um, as you can see, they have a revolving credit line of $1.5 billion that they have not yet tapped into, um, followed by term, uh, two term loans, A and B, which are due in 2023 and 2025, respectively. Um, of note, these term loans can be paid without penalty, and we believe that management will pay all or a portion of these to delever their balance sheet. Subordinate to that, they have two senior notes, the five and seven eighths, which we are recommending, and the six and three eighths. Both of these uh, notes are, trade, are rated at a B minus and are trading at a 440 point spread. Uh, this represents a high leverage capital structure with a debt to EBITDA of eight times and a coverage ratio of two times. From an enterprise value perspective, Lionsgate has about $2 billion in market cap and holds about $3 billion of net debt um, which gives them a debt to equity ratio of about 60 40 which is highly leveraged relative to its peers and now rob is going to talk a little bit about how the management has been thinking about how to delever their balance sheet so management has been uh public with its desire to delever the company uh specifically in their q1 earnings call the cfo said they're targeting about a four times leverage ratio by the end of fiscal 2020. So how they're going to do this, the company's also said, uh, management's indicate they don't want to do an equity issuance. The stock has been under a lot of downward pressure over the last few years, so this would send the wrong signal in the market. So they've talked about unlocking value from within the company, and specifically they referred to stars. So this has uh, been widely reported as well in the media. Uh, back in May, CBS was reported to be in talks to buy their entire stars division. Uh, and more recently in October, the Wall Street Journal reported that Lionsgate was still considering spinning off stars through a special acquisition vehicle. And we think this is more likely now than ever because of a recent catalyst event. So in August in 2019, uh, Comcast announced that they were going to be dropping stars from its cable package. This would result in 9 million subscribers currently through stars uh, being dropped, uh, which would have a knock-on effect on the business. 
This has become more and more likely to occur, and Moody's now placed Lionsgate debt rating uh, review for a downgrade, which immediately caused a spike in the spreads of these bonds. So they, it peaked to almost over 550 basis points. It's come down a bit since then, but what this reflects is how susceptible this company is to negative outlook based on its highly levered and highly uh, risky debt structure. So we think that in light of this, management is going to be more likely to actively target getting down to that four times ratio, and we think the stars divestiture is probably how they're going to get there. So moving forward to what stars would look like on a pro forma basis, we anticipate a sale potentially being announced January 1st, 2020. Uh, so we have to project out what is stars going to be worth in January 1st, 2020, in light of this loss of potential 9 million subscribers through Comcast. So we did a performa analysis. We projected this out with the lower uh, number of MVPD subscribers, which is through the Comcast subscribers, and projected growth in their OTT system, which they've been seeing on a go-forward basis. So we end up with an EBITDA number of about 295 million, a revenue of about 1.1 billion on a next uh, 12 months basis. And we applied the multiples from the 2016 acquisition of stars to project what the company would be worth on a pro forma basis. To kind of round out the analysis, we also looked at the 2017 Epics transaction. This is another uh, entertainment package that Lionsgate was a part of. They divested about their 30% interest in 2017. We looked at that subscriber multiple and applied that as well. So coming up with a range of about 2.9 billion to 3.7 billion, uh, we went on the conservative end again in order to make our analysis uh, more protected. So we looked at a $3 billion projected valuation and we anticipate they would sell about 40% of this to generate 1.2 billion in revenue. So looking at financial projections, what is Lionsgate going to look like after divesting stars? Well, the fundamental business we actually think is still quite strong. Uh, this is a hits-driven industry, and we projected out that their t the revenue growth in the film industry and t TV and production is actually going to continue to grow and grow well. In particular, because of the Hunger Games franchise and the John Wick franchise, we can look at historical performance of those movies and add that into our future revenue growth. In addition to that, they're still going to have 60% ownership of stars, as Stars becomes a more profitable platform going forward, uh, they're still going to have a percentage of that and have positive unlevered free cash flow. So the final debt to EBITDA ratio they're going to have after this transaction is in that four, four times range, which is in keeping with their comps. Uh, now uh, Jeff is going to talk about what that might imply for the debt spread. So in order to assess the impact that this improving credit profile is going to have on where the bonds are trading, what we did is we looked at market comparables. Specifically, we took a group of indus entertainment industry bonds in the five-year space and tried to get an assessment of, based on their credit profile, where their bonds are trading. As you can tell by the graphs we're showing, we found some pretty meaningful relationships between total leverage as measured by debt to EBITDA, as well as a coverage ratio. Carrying that forward, we then translated you know, our pro forma Lionsgate after the sale of, uh, or the disposition of stars to project out what the implied spread from that transaction, or post that transaction would be. This data suggests a range of 205 to 360, both well within the current trading levels of 440. We also took a more uh, historical and holistic approach. We tried to map out sort of the relationship between specific credit metrics, company and bond ratings, and then where bonds aligned with those ratings uh, in the five-year space for trading. As a reminder, these bonds currently are rated B minus and are on negative outlook. However, our numbers indicate that it should be more in the in between the single B and double B range. Um, and then given specifically sort of where we're situating them within that, uh, we're seeing a, a range between 185 and 280, and the data suggests a, a, about a 230 spread. So as we sort of triangulate these three data points, we come up with a target spread of, of 265. Again, about 180 basis points inside of where they're trading right now. Um, also from a risk-reward perspective, we think the downside is somewhat limited. Uh, part of this is tied to where they're currently trading as a result of the recent spike in yields after the Moody's report. Um, but our, this is uh, shown by our bear scenario, which basically assumes that uh, management decides not to pursue deleveraging strategies. And in that event, uh, the growth that we're projecting in EBITDA will sort of slightly improve their leverage to the seven and a half times range. Uh, this, the, the bonds under this credit profile should be trading in this 480 range. We got this from the recent movement in, in the bond prices. As Rob said, they spiked initially to a little over 550. Uh, a very volatile time in the, in the market for the bonds, digesting that news. So it took sort of the average range over a 10-day trading period, uh, which leveled off in, in the 480 range. So we think the downside is, is somewhat limited. So in conclusion, uh, we think that the market has over-penalized uh, Lionsgate and these bonds specifically. Uh, we do not think the Moody's report accurately captures the risk profile of the company. We think they will look to delever their balance sheet and, and significantly improve their credit metrics. And we think their core business lines of motion picture and television are built 
are going to be able to support continued revenue growth in the future. Uh, thank you, and we look forward to your questions. When uh, looking at your model on page 18, does this incorporate the sale of the 40% stake in STARS? Yeah. So this is our uh, base scenario that we've done a performa for. So we've adjusted the media networks for the 60% stake that we have. So we have our projections for what the STARS division would look like and apply the 60% revenue that they would retain on a performa basis. How come you don't see a drop in EBITDA? And what year is the sale contemplated? So sales contemplated, so it's, with the fiscal year is a little bit funny. It's March, uh, it's, we're actually now in their 2020 fiscal year. Sure. Um, so we've had to adjust for the period adjustment for the 2020 estimate and the 2021 estimate. But as, in terms of projecting out how the revenues work, it, it will land in the 2021 is when it will close. And that's how it's been projected into the numbers. And so the follow up is the effect on EBITDA. Yeah, so the drop comes, yeah, so there's two different things kind of going on here. We are losing part of STARS. We are then also reducing our interest rates. In addition, the higher value part of the STARS business is the OTT subscription service. So that trend line is going up, generating significant revenue. So there's kind of two offsetting lines going on here, which allows the company to continue to kind of maintain that EBITDA and then grow that. Because given that the yeah, STARS EBITDA is 295 million, it just, you would think there'd be a bigger impact? Uh, I think when we flow through, the, oh, uh, sorry, my mistake, yes. So the big reason that those numbers don't have that number is in 2021 fiscal year is when we're anticipating the first Hunger Games movie to come out. Uh, and just to touch on what we think that will impact uh, their returns, we looked at the historic returns for these movies, and we know the years that they forecast that they will come out. And we added that additional revenue to the top line for the movie industry. So historically, when you look at Lionsgate's performance in the years that they have a Hunger Games movie, there is a significant spike. It's not a linear trend. It's one year they could be out $500 million based on if this movie comes out. So it just so happens in the 2021 fiscal year, we're adding in the effect of that movie. And in 2022, we're actually adding in the next John Wick movie, again, taking a conservative approach to what these movies generated previously, which actually, in our case, we chose 50%. So if the last Hunger Games movie generated $600 million, we're going to apply $300 million additional in an, on top of a continued steady growth within that industry base, and similarly with John Wick. And then in fact, if you look forward, we don't have any incremental gains from blockbuster movies because we can't project out that far, but other parts of the business have now taken off. That's why it looks like a steady growth, but there's actually a few different moving parts to get to that. Would you mind walking through how you thought about what they do with stars, either in the form of an asset sale or a spin, how that impacts the bonds, do the bonds allow it? Um, just talk about how you were thinking about what they might potentially do there. Yeah, so the, the rumor transaction type uh, that the Wall Street Journal was referring to is a special acquisition company. So they would create a company and they would transfer over the star's ownership. Um, the way it would probably play out is they would transfer debt over as well in order to delever the balance sheet of Lionsgate. And then Lionsgate would own part of the company and then whoever invested it would own part of that company. Um, our understanding is this could be negotiated with uh, the current uh, term sheet holders. Uh, as long as the covenants were maintained, uh, this structure would make sense, and that's certainly the one that's uh, out in the media that they're considered. So you think that the bonds will travel to stars? Not the bonds, the term loans. The loan will? Yeah, so the, the term loans are the ones that we want to delever. So they can either generate cash, if they just sold it, they could pay off the loans, or alternatively they could transfer that into another entity, and that still gets it off the balance sheet of where the bonds are, which is for the landscape effectively gets us to the same position in terms of the coverage for the bonds. And did you guys think about, uh, the news with Comcast is obviously big. Mm -hmm. um, did you think about where leverage would go? Uh, what does that look like, the impact of, of that? And then thinking about other carriage agreements they may have coming up in the future. at t is one they did in the past, that kind of got ironed out. But um, what's kind of in the pipeline for that? And I think the reason I ask that is because we've seen a lot of pushback in terms of carriage, uh, more so I think recently than in the past, and so it's just getting a lot more attention. So where do we stand with that? What's the next big one that could potentially come up? Yeah, I can sort of dive into this a little bit. So we are seeing this tension in the industry. Uh, one of the reasons uh, that we believe the Comcast deal didn't work out is because Stars is very clearly pursuing an OTT strategy, which is over the top, where you know you and I can go to stars.com and pay nine dollars a month and get all that content directly through Stars. This cuts out companies like Comcast. Um, which had their own prior relationship. 
So that deal with Comcast was expiring in 20, at the end of this year. Uh, and obviously they couldn't come to a reconciliation where it made sense, but it's because it's on both parties. So we have figures on what the average revenue per user is for different market segments. So for example, under OTT, it's approximately $6.60 per user is the average revenue versus MVPD, which is, uh, in this case, about 3 to $4. So there's quite a difference, and it's actually been reported in the media that the Comcast deal was even worse than the average deal that they have. So you reference the AT&T deal, there's also a DISH deal that's recently been signed. So those are actually contracting and going forward. So we think those are relatively stable. Notwithstanding all of that, I agree with the general premise, and so we have shown a slow deterioration from that quick drop of 9 million, and we've shown a deterioration of MVPD over time, because this is a bit of the older way of the industry. But that is being offset by the higher revenue of the OTT system that we think is gonna steadily grow in the future. And I'll just add on a little with that. We, that was also part of our modeling for our bear case, um, which is why you don't see that deleveraging happening. Um, however, this pro forma for STARS is embedded in those financials. Uh, and so we still see, given some of the hits in the motion picture division that are coming down, we still see that slight EBITDA uh, or the, the slight leverage improvement. Um, and that's, again, tied to our recent performance in the market where we don't see the bonds selling off that much more than they have in the last few weeks. So uh, for asking the question, just out of curiosity, did you guys, this bond tighten on you 100 basis points during your due diligence? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Absolutely did. Well, it's really attractive that high seven. Extremely <laughs> violent. <laughs> don't you hate the last It's still a good story, though. We yeah. still like it. Yeah. Um, so isolating stars. So if I recall, the bid from CBS that was contemplated was about $5 billion. Mm -hmm. So you lost about 40%. Is it, was it Comcast about 40% of the, of third, the subs for the... Third. A third, yeah. Which doesn't seem to necessarily, you know, it seems to compute with your, you know, reassessment that it might be worth $3 billion. I was thinking more as to what Comcast might be signaling, though, about that enterprise and, and the value of it. And effectively, you answered it by saying that, okay, well, yes, but we've signed on DISH, we've signed on at and And the other component is you said, well, we're replacing those subs with, with uh, OTT. You talked about the revenue difference. Are the economics on an OTT sub better, equal, or worse than a, a cable sub? So you talked about revenue, but what about yeah, the cost of the margin? Yeah, so the economics are much better, um, but we have uh, taken that into consideration in an OTT system. So one of the advantages of the old carrier system is that you've got Comcast going out there telling everyone about stars. If you're doing it on your own, you're gonna have to increase your costs. So we did do an adjustment to the SGNA. We had that actually stepping up a little bit going forward. We anticipate they would be investing a little bit in that. So in that sense, the margins are tightening a bit, but their average revenue per customer is so much higher under the system that their overall margins for this business segment are going to be much significantly higher going forward, even with that cost increase. And are they able to replace the same mass subscribers? So you, now you have the economics that you think might become co comparable. You lost 9 million subscribers. Mm -hmm. Where are they on the OTT replacement? Uh, yeah, so projecting out. So in the last quarter alone, they added 1.2 million subscribers in one quarter. Big jump. We're not going to project that going forward, but that took them from 4.4 to 5.6. So those are actuals for Q1 and Q2. On a go-forward basis, we projected a lower growth rate, about 600,000 subscribers kind of marching forward. Uh, there's also been guidance from the company of the kind of growth that they're expecting in both this segment and the Stars Plays International, which you'll see has much faster growth. That's another part of the business that they are very concentrated on, is growing internationally, where they actually have a lot less competitors in that space, and they have a bit of an early mover advantage in a lot of those markets. Um, so we, we think in many ways these hit what the company is forecasting and are probably conservative in some regards. Is your base case that CBS is the ultimate acquirer? Uh, so there's actually a few different scenarios we could envision. So CBS Viacom, as many, many people might be aware, are currently in a transaction and will probably be closing in by the year's end. That still makes a lot of sense. They have CBS All Access and Showtime, 8 million subscribers. It's not that bulky in the industry. They can still definitely be an acquirer. But we see other partnerships potentially being out there as well. So currently, Stars is distributed internationally through Apple TV, for example. Apple recently launched their Apple Plus service. They only have nine original shows. They have tons of cash. So that's a synergy that we could definitely see being played in the forward. Amazon in a similar position. So there's actually a few people out there that we can see partnering uh, on the transaction with Stars. Do you know what they paid for Stars? Four point four billion. Do you think that they'd be willing to part with it at a three billion dollar valuation? So I think what we've seen with the reaction to the market of just a, a negative outlook on their spread 
spiking to over 550 points, and they have been telling the market for over a year that they want to delever. They're really running out of options. So we think they still want to keep a part of that business. We're not anticipating a full sale. Uh, but they have to also recognize that the market is getting shifted since when they acquired it. And in order to get on sounder footing, uh, we just think it's the most logical step for Python to take. But it's definitely that's why we're, we're hanging our hat on this catalyst event as well, right? This is the market messaging to them stronger than it has. If you looked at our, you know, our spread graph since these bonds were issued, they were trading in that 250 to 300 range, range for a long time. And the leverage profile was basically the same. Um, but this is now the market sort of way of informing the company, like, you're going to have to change something now. And so we think that after discussing it for quite a while now that this is going to be the catalyst that, that sort of forces uh, management's hand. Yeah, pitch 21, um, liquidation value. Um, you've got a line here on inventory of film and TV. I'm just wondering what the confidence level is around that number, the recovery rating of, of 80 on that, and, and kind of what what's in there. Yeah, sure. So. Um, yeah, as you see, we highlighted program rights and investment in, in film and TV. So what this is, this is the capitalized costs of all their investments historically in their television and, and movie production. Uh, from an accounting perspective, these are held on the balance sheet at LOCOM, lower cost or market. And according to their disclosures, they are impairing or going through impairment testing on an annual basis, on a program by program basis. So theoretically speaking, um, the values that are presented on the balance sheet should represent somewhat of a floor of the value of these. Now, with that being said, that's putting a lot of faith in the Lionsgate accountants and their DCF models, and then also understanding that in any sort of liquidation event, there's gonna be market pressure. Uh, so we do haircut that value 20%, but again, if we sort of couple that with the theoretical view that if something is impaired on an annual basis and is held at low come on the balance sheet, um, even a 20% haircut, in our view, still is probably a little, uh, a little conservative. In addition, when you overlay the macro, the industry view of this battle for content, um, we do think that there'd be some significant bids for the content. Um, so a couple of that, again, we think our 20% is, is still conservative. Has there been any history of write-off, inventory write-off? Uh, not in the last few years. And have, they, have they lost content personnel, significant content personnel? Uh, I cannot wait to so. Yeah, along those lines, um, I kind of view the current, you know, situation with the media companies as it's a seller's market for content producers, uh, and it's almost like we're in a tech bubble for content. Um, how good of a job has Lionsgate, Lionsgate done in terms of managing costs on the production side, and is that a concern that you guys have? And then also, in your down, downside scenario, your bear scenario, You've got leverage at seven and a half, basically seven and a half times versus currently eight point two. Um, so, in a really bad scenario where they're not able to deliver, as well as not able to generate some some money from Lionsgate, um, it seems difficult that leverage would decrease. I understand that they could increase EBITDA, but um, maybe walk through that a little bit too. Sure. Well, on that, I'll answer that point first, and then. Um handle some of the cost <coughs> questions, sure. uh, which is also why we added in the liquidation value that we just sort of went through. Um, and when we go through that, again, which we do think are underlying conservative assumptions on the assets of, of the balance sheet are a little conservative. Um, given that we were able to pay through the term loans and still recover 84 cents on the dollar. So in a true, true worst case scenario that you are presenting, um, an 84 cent recovery rate, given sort of our base scenario, we think is a, is a good risk for work trade off. On the cost side, uh, they've actually been remarkably consistent. Uh, about 18 months ago, they did announce a general restructuring of how they do their film industry. Uh, you can see they performed rather poorly in the 2019 uh, fiscal year. Um, at that time, they announced they were going to sort of restructure how they're doing things. They're kind of reaping the fruits of that labor right now. Uh, so, in terms of uh, ability to generate positive income from those departments, uh, they are now cash positive in those units. So, but generally, the cost structure doesn't, they don't seem to step to wild fluctuations in that area. Do you have any final questions? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, judges. My name is Anna, and I'm here today with my colleagues, um, Mike, Daniel, and Loretta. We're Team Theta, and today we're here to pitch Suncoke Energy. 
Um, to give you a brief roadmap of what we'll be talking about, we'll begin with our recommendation and we'll go through a bit of the company background as well as the coke making industry as a whole. We'll then go through our financial projections and elaborate on our investment thesis. Finally, we'll wrap up with a discussion of different risks um, associated with our investment and relative value and trading costs. So to begin, our recommendation is to purchase Suncook Energy 7.5 senior notes due 2025. Um, these bonds are currently trading at $84.71, and our target price for them is $99. In terms of a uh, company overview, Suncook has two primary um, businesses that it operates in. One is coke making, and two is logistics. Coke making re represents about 90% of the revenues for Suncook Energy, and this business is primarily um, converting coal into coke, which is a key component used in blast furnace and steel production. Um, in terms of this business, Suncoke operates using long-term take-or-pay contracts with its consumers. The logistics business represents a little under less than 10% um, of the revenue for Suncoke, and it basically provides handling and mixing services for its end clients. Suncoke operates facilities on the East Coast Great Lakes region, and most importantly, they also operate Comet Marine Terminal, which is the largest export terminal on the Gulf Coast. I'll now pass it to my colleague Daniel to talk about the industry as a whole. Thanks, Anna. So I think the first thing that I want to highlight about this industry is the extremely high barriers for entry. So we're talking about an average of $300 million to $600 million in investments to get one of these coke batteries uh, up and running. Um, on top of that, uh, we have also seen a very strong secular trend in which we're going to see we have seen a stricter regu uh, environmental regulatory uh, impact, uh, which has meant in practice that we have seen more and more disinvestment from this industry. Uh, because of this, we have seen a lot of capacity loss. So uh, over the last five years, we've seen 2.5 million uh, tons of capacity loss, uh, and we expect this to continue. Why? If you look at the bottom charts here, what you see is that the average, uh, the average age of coke making facilities is about 48 years old. So where does Sun Coke stand uh, given this context? Well, Sun Coke has one of the leading technological capabilities in the industry. In fact, the average age for the coke making facility for, for Sun Coke is 15 years old, which is more than half, less than half of the industry average for North America. On top of that, Suncoke also has the best uh, technology in terms of environmental, of environmental signature. In fact, the EPA used them as the benchmark when evaluating uh, new coke making facilities uh, uh, over, the, uh, over the United States. Uh, also, you have to think this not only in terms of your ESG uh, preoccupations, but also in the fact that environmental risk is a key risk uh, for this industry. So given all of this, all this trend, we expect Suncoke to continue to gain market share, and with market share, price and power. With this, I'm going to pass to Mike, I was going to talk about our investment thesis. Thank you. So I'm going to start out with the financial model here. I'm not going to go into the details of the assumptions, but at high level, we believe that the company will be able to continue generating stable EBITDA and free cash flow through the life of the bonds, and that by the end of 2025, we'll end with net leverage of 2.2 times. Um, which brings us to our investment thesis. You know, our favorable view on this credit is really underpinned by the fact that they generate stable free cash flow as a result of their uh, long-term take-or-pay contracts that, pi uh, that pass through the commodity price risk to their customers. Um, now, we believe that they're going to be able to continue renewing these contracts because they have the youngest and most efficient fleet of coke-making facilities in the industry. Um, and finally, um, they have a strong balance sheet. Uh, management has done a great job at bringing leverage down to their three times target. They've done a number of things that are very bond holder friendly. And we think that they will continue to prioritize right sizing the balance sheet um, as the company continues performing. Um, so, starting with the stable free cash flow, um, you know, a lot of investors are wary of owning coal assets for a number of reasons. Um, there's obviously some secular headwinds. API 2 prices are at multi year lows. Um, but Suncoke is unique in that their long term take or pay contracts pass through all commodity price risk to their customer. So they're able to generate a stable uh, EBITDA per ton, um, meaning that they will be able to continue generating free cash flow through the commodity cycle, which is very important in a, in a coal-based industry. Um, taking a look at their contracts, so they have four contracts with ArcelorMittal, they have two with AK Steel, and they have uh, one with US Steel. And I just want to highlight the three upcoming uh, contract expirations. One of them is with the Haverhill One contract. Um, the volumes from there are going to the Indiana Harbor Mill. Uh, they have the Jewel contract, um, where volumes are being sent to Cleveland. And finally, AK Steel Haverhill Hill 2, uh, where volumes uh, were going to Ashland, and then once Ashland's closed, they uh, started going to uh, Dearborn. 
And we just want to highlight um, on the Brazil facility, so that's an unowned facility. Um, it's a licensing and operating agreement that they have with ArcelorMittal. Um, ArcelorMittal actually asked Suncoke to help them design, build, and operate their coke making facility in uh, Brazil. So here's our base case and downside case for uh, the contract volumes. Um, in our base case, we believe that the company is able to uh, renew all of their contracts, um, the only exception being Haverhill 2, where uh, volumes will be split in half. And this is due to the fact that uh, AK Ashton has been shut down. There's certainly uh, upside here in that uh, Dearborn could take the full volumes, but uh, for conservatism, we're assuming that it's uh, half the volume. Um, in our downside case, just to stress the credit, um, we assume that the Haverhill 2 uh, and Haverhill 1 contracts are not renewed. And as you can see here, even if that's the case, um, the company still generates stable EBITDA and ends with 144 million EBITDA. Now, um, this is obviously an industry in secular decline. Um, blast furnace steel production has been exceeding um, market share to EAFs, and we believe this will be, continue to be the case. Um, and with that means that uh, uh, coke production will, uh, or coke demand will uh, reduce as well, which is why it's very important that Suncoke has the youngest and most efficient fleet of coke making facilities in the industry. Um, they have a history of taking um, capacity from integrated steel players who largely don't want to be in this business because of the EPA fines and the, uh, the CapEx needs um, with, uh, that sort of come with their older facilities. Um, switching over to logistics quickly, so the Common Marine Terminal is really their marquee asset here. Um, it's had some uh, short-term headwinds with two of their customers, but we believe that uh, these, uh, they're managing these well and that this is uh, the lowest cost option for Illinois Basin producers to access the uh, the seaborne, uh, seaborne export market, which means that they will be able to diversify their customer base and uh, this uh, remains to be a profitable asset. Finally, um, to the balance sheet, um, it's a clean, relatively clean balance sheet. Uh, management has done a number of things in order to get leverage down. Um, in the past, they've shut down the MLP dividend. They collapsed the broken MLP structure. Um, most recently in August, they actually um, had the SXC hold co um, guarantee the bonds, which added additional asset coverage, um, which the market didn't seem to price in. Um, and as you can see here, the, uh, the debt maturity schedule is pretty clean. Um, the biggest maturity is in 2025 with our 650 million bonds. Um, in a downside scenario, there's plenty of asset coverage here. Um, in our most uh, sort of worst case scenario, we believe that we get about 81% recovery on these assets, um, assuming a pretty big haircut on all of them. And more importantly, this company continues to generate free cash flow. They have uh, 100, almost 100 million of cash on the balance sheet, and they have a $400 million revolver, of which they have 245 available. And lastly, we want to talk about risk. Um, our investment comes with risk, and some Cook's risk reward profile is good to the upside, but we still want to highlight them for investors to keep in mind. Specifically, there are two of them. First of all, is secular risk. The US PMI is contracting and a softer auto market means um, it's negative for steel makers. Steel mills across North America are slowing down and some are shutting down, which because of lower steel price and that would result in lower coke demand. However, we believe in Suncoke's business model is resilient against a negative end market because of this long-term take or pay contract with provision building, path through provisions building. And additionally, we also study historical cycles and we find out that the steel makers have been able to fulfill Suncoke's pay, take or pay contract during stress time. Second is customer concentration. Mer uh, ArcelorMittal, uh, ArcelorMittal US Steel, UK Steel, AS, UK Steel, AS, US Steels are, uh, represent 94% 90, of Suncoke's sales in the first half of 2019. That means Suncoke is exposed to contract renegotiation risk when those contracts are due. But we believe Suncoke. <coughs> but we believe Suncoke, because of its newer and more efficient of its, uh, assets, is able to um, endure against that. Because when steelmakers are cutting production, they are like more likely to cut the productions from other suppliers or internally before they cut supplies from Suncoke. And lastly, we want to highlight our target price of ninety nine cents on a dollar and six hundred percent spread towards. This is based on our comparable analysis with bonds issued by industry peers in the 2025 maturity and also rated in single B or triple C range. As you can see, Suncoke's price is significantly lower than its competitors, even though it has a strong cash flow and a solid financial profile. That will be all from us, and now we are open to questions. So on page nine. Mm -hmm. 
I feel like this is one of probably the more important slides Absolutely. To, the, to the credit. So um, I think you identified, which it sounded correct, that the long-term take or pay contracts sort of insulate this from volatility mm -hmm. through cycle and the underlying commodity price. The problem seems to be is that a lot of the contracts are coming up mm -hmm. pretty soon. And so um, the, the thing is, is I guess, can you talk a little bit about what, when you think about these end customers coming back to the negotiating table, what does the current environment look like? What do you think sort of the incentive structure is, the negotiating leverage? Where do you think these contracts are currently struck relative to probably maybe where the market price is? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the financial situation of some of these customers that they're very much concentrated with. Um, as you probably know, AK Steel and US Steel are not on the best financial footing. Yeah. Um, so yes, I mean it's it's tough having all these uh, maturities or these expirations come up at a time where um, the domestic steel market isn't under pressure. Um, we do believe that there will be some pricing concession because of the fact that um, the steel makers on or the industry in general is some so slightly worse footing than it has been in the past. Um, so we believe that the pricing um, we model in about fifty uh, fifty dollars even top per ton um, compared to I think it was like about sixty five sixty seven. Uh, uh, for the prior NLP assets. Um, so we do think that they're gonna to have to take some concession there. But the fact is we have pretty really strong conviction that they're gonna be able to renew these contracts because you know, going back to the fact that this is a very high quality asset base, um, ArcelorMittal, US Steel, they've had a lot of issues with their internal coke making facilities, um, both with the uh, you know, pollution um, regulation, EPA fees, um, and uh, it's unlikely that they would choose to not renew these contracts and instead put more money into their own internal coping facilities, especially in the fact, as you mentioned, a lot of these balance sheets, such as AK and the US, uh, are on difficult footing. So, uh. yeah. Just so uh, I can add to this, the fact that uh, although we're talking about the cycle decline in the steel making industry, this industry is still at capacity. So right now the capacity is around uh, 12 million uh, tons of production. And demand right now is around 11.5. So if there is any other investment or any other closure of facilities, we're going to see uh, some folks taking some of that market share. And just quickly, the um, sort of the utilization, so the utilization of this industry. Now the end customers specifically, it's these integrated plants. Um, did you do some work into understanding what the utilization is of, of those specific plants? I think I know a lot of these. Steel comp uh, conglomerates are shifting their production over to mini mills over mm -hmm. over integrated steel. Mm -hmm. Mini mills don't use coke. Yeah. Um, so maybe a little bit about the financial situation of the end customer. Yeah. So I mean that has obviously been the shift for the past whatever couple of decades. Uh, shift to EAS. Um, I think that we get comfortable on this is uh, because most of the mills um, that they are servicing coke to uh, primarily service autos, and as you know, mini mills can't make auto uh, quality steel. Um, it's not the, it's about, you know, over half of the production of these mills are going to auto, um, so it's not the entirety of it. Um, in terms of capacity utilization, so we're at 100%. Um, these mills, I think, I don't know the specific mill amounts. Um, I know U.S. quality is around 82, 83 for capacity utilization. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense. And also to add to Max's point, so coconut steels are for requires further processing from hot roast steels, which are thinner, more endurable, and it's more, more uniform. So it's higher quality. That's why it's specifically used in the auto industry. And also it's in, used in a lot of highly engineered appliance and construction. So that's why there's no direct conflict with the other, like the smaller minimals in the product. So along those lines of supply, you mentioned two and a half million uh, you know, tons was closed, but Suncoke was able to pick up a little bit. Um, do you know how much of that uh, sort of went away, com uh, you know, permanently? And um, can you also talk about, I guess, the uh, the contract, um, the Granite City contract expiring or not renewed? Um, you know, what was the reason behind that? Um. So a little bit about um, that, the granite one was mainly um, given the 
earlier steel tariffs, they decided to delay the kind of closing down of that mill and actually brought it granite online again. Um, and after the tariffs were relaxed, the steel tariffs were relaxed with Mexico and Canada, um, you kind of had the um, prices become a little less competitive than I guess like the market had projected. So that's a little bit um, kind of underlying um, what happened in the granite area. Mm -hmm. Did you want to? Yeah, so our assumption that it goes away is mostly out of conservatism. And sort of to your point earlier, U.S. steel is not on the best footing right now financially. So um, there's certainly a, a, a chance that they do, um, you know, file for bankruptcy in the near future um, or in the next couple of years. So this is essentially, you know, trying to sensitize around that as well. Um, there's certainly op the possibility that Grand City stays online and that we are able to renew that contract. And I think that if in 2025 Grand City City's uh, still operating, then there's a high likelihood of renewal. Um, we just think that. Uh, that's less likely, especially given the fact that, as you mentioned, Granite's uh, mostly selling into construction, and that's a market where EAS are really um, taking the cake. So. Your uh, industry uh, data on five, I'm, I'm just curious of the capacity, how much of that is being utilized today in the upper right? Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's around 90% uh, of capacity being utilized. So this is the projected demand, this is the, the projected capacity. So pretty much all the capacity is utilized. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Some coaches yeah. got it. Okay. Okay. Exactly. No, nothing allowed. And yeah. then uh, the bottom chart, you yeah. have your your age, which is, it looks great, but does that translate into a meaningful uh, conversion cost difference conversion between cost. Suncoke and the rest of the rest of, rest of the capacity? Like a cost, a, a, a is a cost curve much different between a new facility and an old? Oh, oh yes, absolutely. Because if, what happens in the new facilities, they have uh, they have better environmental uh, standards than the old facilities. In fact, uh, a lot of these of these facilities they were actually operating, but they had to close because of stricter re environmental regulations. And in order for you to actually improve these facilities, you actually have to make investments that were also very big, right? So you're pretty much paying uh, to improve existing facilities almost as much to raise the new facilities. So I, I was reading an EPA paper from 1997, and it was saying, you know, the, uh, one of the facilities in Indiana, which was actually a very big facility, they have to close because to, uh, in order to actually for them to uh, abide by new EPA rules, you have to invest around $400 million. So it's a huge cost, even though they're up and running, a lot of these capacity, a lot of these capacity is being closed down just because of new regulations, which is where uh, uh, Simcoe's uh, uh, environmental standard really comes in and comes in strong. <clears throat> to add on that, um, although we show that the industry average is 48, some of these facilities um, with the competitors are like at operating at 80 years old. So compared to Suncoke's um, assets, which are 15 years old, the technology is much more advanced. So they're much more efficient at coke making, which does lower the costs, um, which also kind of backs our thesis of why we think the contract negotiations uh, will probably go through because um, steel producers are facing kind of um, industry price pressures. So signing with um, Suncoke would kind of alleviate the input yeah. costs for them. That, that, that data there on the bottom uh, includes uh, integrated as well? Yes. And is it still an MLP? Uh, no, so they collapse the MLP structure. Um, they, they collapse the structure, but is it still, is it C Corp so, or is it an MLP? A, yeah, it's not an MLP anymore. So okay. basically, the Sunco like Hold Co. bought the MLP. Um, so right, but it still could be structured it's, really as an MLP. Yeah, it's not structured as an MLP anymore. Yeah, so, and that's yeah, helpful because they had things. issues, uh, pat, uh, you yeah. know, getting cash from the hold code in order yeah. to pay down debt, yeah, so, yeah. Looks like uh, in 2019, there was a meaningfully, uh, or even 2018, there was a meaningful step up in CapEx, and then you kind of have that going forward. Can you yeah. uh, elaborate on why? Um, yeah, so, uh, it's a little messy because in 20, so anything before 2019 was just looking at the MLP, which is where these bonds were held. So um, that did not include the Indiana Harbor, Jewel, um, <clears throat> sorry, Jewel City, and the Brazil assets. So starting in 2019, actually 3Q, after the bonds were guaranteed by the Hold Co., we included those assets as well um, in the financial projections. Um, and that's important because Indiana Harbor just finished a large uh, four-year rebuild of all of their uh, coking ovens. So they had a large spike up in, a, in, a, in CapEx. Um, so that'll drop down, and 65 million is about the run rate for the assets, including the non-MLP assets, going forward for management. Yeah. So your your price target on the bonds, I think you mentioned 99, and I'm just kind of wondering over what horizon and what what are the you know what's the catalyst to really make that bond improve, and is it just sort of a 
you know, a melt up from industry performance, or is there something idiosyncratic going on with, with this story? Uh, so our horizon for the target price would be um, essentially end of uh, 2020 um, slash early 2021. And that's mainly because, um, as Mike discussed, the different contracts, um, primarily right now the bonds are taking a hit because there's a lot of industry concern around the 2020 contracts that are up for renegotiation um, with uh, Arcelor Mittal. And so we think that, you know, we are bullish on the contract negotiations going through, in which case we expect the kind of bond prices to trade up to our target price. Um, and I, uh, the bonds have also um, recently traded down. The, the reason for the lower price of 84, especially versus comps, is also due to some problem, some short-term headwinds with their convent marine terminal. Um, there's a, One of their customers has filed for bankruptcy, so there's a little bit of concern there. But um, that terminal is the largest exporter um, in uh, with rail-capable um, abilities. So we f we feel that in the short in the long term they'll be able to find additional customers to make up for that. So it, we think that the market has um, unreasonably punished Suncoke for um, some of the short-term headwinds. Yeah. How quick do they um, try to start to renegotiate these these contracts? A year in advance, okay. six months? Yeah, um, mm -hmm. currently this management guidance, they obviously haven't said much about the um, negotiations, but they are speaking with Arcelor now about their 2020 renewals, so they're working on it. A year in advance? Yeah, essentially. Um, so we'd imagine they're, they're not obviously before the end of the uh, maturity, so that should be a near-term catalyst. What do you think happens if U.S. Steel files for bankruptcy? question. Um, so obviously, it's not great. So they're going to restrike the um, take pay contract that they have at Granite City. Um, this is a big question of do they shut down Granite City altogether? Um, I, they had one um, one of their furnaces was shut down and brought back online. Um, in the instance where you, uh, U.S. Steel does go bankrupt, I imagine that that shuts down again, meaning there's going to be less of a demand for coke. But in the case where they keep Granite City online, then there's a good chance that they continue taking volumes from Suncoke, albeit a, a, presumably a lower price, so they negotiate it down. Um, but there is an outside chance that uh, they shut down that facility entirely, in which case you would see those volumes go to zero. Really quick on, on slide six, um, just looking at the, the cash bill over time, mm -hmm. is there something else going on that's not being captured there. If you're looking at the free cash flow and how much it generates on a year over year basis, for example, if you're looking at 2020, uh, they've got you know 94 million and then they're supposedly generating 67, but your cash balance actually goes down. Um, yeah, so Is there's something else going on there, or just yeah, they're prepaying uh, their revolver there. Okay. We, we have them uh, paying out who gave up that. Got it. I'm um, in the building, it's just for the fun. Got it. All right, we have the clock here. Do you have any final question for Team Stato? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you for being here. My name is Ivan Campanigara, and I was a commercial banker before this. I'm Megan. I was in credit risk management. I'm Javier. I did distress PE and distress credit hedge funds. I'm Rumil. I'm doing MBA at Dr. Fonsi. And we're Team Zeta. Today we're presenting Arista. So what is Arista? It's a global B2B supplier of frozen bakery goods to some of the top companies that we know well, McDonald's, Subway, Starbucks coffee. Luckily, we had lunch because I'm hungry just thinking about it. Our executive summary. Our investment recommendation is to recommend the purchase of Aris's three and a half Swiss franc, 190 million perpetual bond at 75 cents on the dollar. This implies a base case of 20 to 25 percent IRR through 2021. And this assumes conservative to neg negative to slightly positive 1% revenue growth. So it's not dependent on that. And only a 200 bips margin expansion, which we'll walk through later. Our worst case scenario is a 7% IRR, which we'll talk through as well. We're four point, where it delevers from 4.8 to 4.4. We have our investment rationale here and our potential risks that we have for your reference. And again, we'll go through this following this. I'll turn it over to Javier to talk through our due diligence process. Thank you, Ivan. So during our due diligence pro process, we, we talked to five main stakeholders. We talked to creditors, shareholders, competitors, the company, and the main customer. And the three main insights that we got were, first, the company has somewhat switching costs with the customers and had huge barriers of entry. 
Second, the management team tends to protect the creditors over shareholders. And third, the creditors are not concerned with the whole leverage in the company, currently at five times, since companies trade between eight and 10 times in this industry. And now we're gonna talk about the company and security overview. So between 2008 and 2014, Arista went a highly debt-funded growth and also made acquisitions to tap into its non-core B2C business. This move made its core B2B customers unhappy. Moreover, they were not able to integrate these acquisitions into its parent company. So when the current management was brought on board, they were immediately Im implemented a project renew with a multi-year turnaround strategy where they're trying to make its operations more efficient and consolidate capacity. The bond terms are like, it's a 190 million split strength perpetual bond with a coupon of 3.5%. It currently has a big structure with no coupons being paid. Capital structure is fairly simple with no structured debt. It only has un uh, unstructured, unsecured and subordinated debt having a face value of 4.8 times EBITDA, but market value of just 4.1 times EBITDA. Transaction structure is also plain vanilla structure with no debt at OPCO level. The perpetual bond that we're pitching is at the same level as term loans, which is a good sign for us and we take comfort in that thing. Now we'll move on to investment thesis. So moving on to the investment thesis, we like to highlight three points that will support our investment recommendation. There are improving fundamentals, both in terms of capital structure and profitability. Two, high expected refinance value, and three, high profile chairman. So we're gonna double click into each of them. Starting with improving capital structure. So over the past two years, Arista successfully deleveraged the company from six times to 5.2 times through selling non core assets, as well as raising equity capital of 740 million euro that happened in 2018. This shows the management's commitment in reducing the company's leverage to a healthy level. So this is what has happened in the past, and going forward, we expect the company to further deleverage as the company's creditors are demanding the company to deleverage over time through tightening financial covenants, as we can see in this financial covenant schedule. Moving on to the profitability, we expect the company's EBITDA margin to improve by 200 basis points from 9% to 11% in 2021, supported by the following considerations. First of all, the company has historically enjoyed 50 to 20% EBITDA margin, but subsequently came down to 9% due to unsuccessful investments into BTC segment, as mentioned by Romeo earlier. Since the company is now focusing on its core B2B, we believe the profitability can be improved. In addition, based on our conversation with the company's um, competitor, the industry generally believes 13 to 15% is a healthy EBITDA margin, as we can see in this peer comparison. This further strengthens our belief that the company's EBITDA margin can be improved. Secondly, the company has clearly outlined specific sources for cost savings, such as back office consolidation, warehouse outsourcing, uh, process automation, etc., and it is on track of achieving those. Last but not least, we are seeing early signs of profitability recovering as those cost saving initiatives are taking effect. More specifically, if we look at the company EBITDA between 2018 and 2019, EBITDA actually went up despite a decline in revenue of 1.5%. This shows the benefit of um, efficiency gains are falling down to the PL. With all those considerations combined, here is our model output. Um, we'd like to highlight two points from this slide. One is that under our base case, the company is able to deleverage to three times in 2021, and this is when we expect the refinancing is likely to happen. And two, even under our conservative downside case scenario, the company is still able to generate free, uh, positive free cash flow that can help boost up the liquidity position. So that concludes our first investment thesis. I'm gonna hand over to Javier to talk about refinancing. Thank you, Megan. So we expect Arista to hit the three times leverage 2021 to years out from today based on organic free cash flow generation, so more asset disposals. At that time, Arista will be paying roughly 30 million for a 4.5% rate on, on our debt. That could be lowered 30 million if they issue and secure debt to replace our, our position. And that will generate a 10% uh, reduction in costs compared to the current EBITDA. 
that will uh, get us to our two main cases, our base case and our worst case. In our base case, we assume that the company will hit the three times leverage in 2021, and the company will refinance both the deferred coupons and the deferred principal, and we'll get a 20 plus percent RR. In our downside case, we are assuming that the company will not refinance our, our bond, but it will refinance our deferred coupons, giving us the opportunity to achieve a 7% plus RRR, assuming that we'll set back, we'll set back uh, the bonds in the market at the same price we're buying today, 75 cents on the dollar. And how is the company going to achieve that? Well, currently, Arista has now secured that in the, in the capital structure. Second, it has 2.6 billion of unencumbered assets, hard assets, mainly bakeries. And we see two options to execute this deal. The first option is to raise unsecured debt, refinance the unse raise unsecured debt to buy back the hybrids in order to clean the capital structure. And the second option, which we prefer and which much like, is to issue both uh, secured and unsecured debt in order to clean the, the lower part of the capital structure. And in fact, one year ago, Arista received a term, sheet, a term sheet before the equity raise with a 1.2 billion facility to execute this transaction. So we are pretty comfortable with this. And now we're going to go and we're going to speak about the management team. So currently at the helm of Arista is the chairman, Gary McCann. He's had a number of notable positions, as you can see on the left, including CEO of multiple uh, companies and chairman as well. Now, why do we take comfort from his leadership? First, he has a track record of turning businesses around. This began with Aer Lingus and Smurfit Capital, which we'll look at as a case study. We think Smurfit Capital looks very similar to what Arista is facing today. Uh, during the financial crisis, when credit markets were extremely tight, he took Smurfit Capital from a 3.4 billion debt, debt level to three, at 3.4x to 2.5 billion at 2.0x, and this improved the capital structure when they really needed it. Second, he played a key role in executing the controversial 2018 Arista equity raise. Uh, he ensured capital to pay off debt through this equity raise. What we like about him is that he consistently puts creditors above shareholders, and this is good for our bond position. Third, he has skin in the game. His legendary career across Europe is culminating with this Arista turnaround, and he's being judged by his performance in this turnaround. Now, what are the reasons for mis mispricing on this bond? First, small size. At 670 million market value, any fund that wants to take a sizable position could single-handedly move the price itself. Additionally, Arista is not a publicly rated credit company, so, so a lot of institutional investors will not take a position at all. Second, a lot of the non-institutional buyers are the ones that currently hold the positions. It's high net worth individuals, and they purchase these for the coupon payments, which are now deferred, and as a result, they are selling them because it's not serving its purpose that they originally bought it for. Last, this is a Swiss franc denominated deal, so USD and Euro investors are oftentimes not looking at this deal, uh, as well as there's a hedging cost of 1.2% that they would have to incur. So going on to the risks and mitigants, the major risk that Arista faces are uh, its highly concentrated customer base, revenue decline in North America, its project renew execution rate risk, its limited ability to pass on commodity price fluctuations to its customers, and limited financial flexibility. In conclusion, we would like to recommend this 190 million Swiss franc perpetual bond at 75 cents on dollar because we see fundamentals improving, a highly influential chairman, and because of high refinancing value. We open for questions now. Hi, I'm not sure this is on, but I'll, I'll ask anyway. Um, you mentioned early, earlier that you contacted customers, suppliers, uh, and the management team. I'm just curious what you learned from those conversations that you didn't know before. So we didn't talk to suppliers. We talked to the customers. The, customers. the main insight that we got is that this company has a huge customer risk because 50 plus 50 percent of the revenue comes from the 20 percent top from from 20 top customers so what we learned is that arista structures the, the the contracts with their clients in a way that they cannot impair one customer if if it goes under so 
Arista structured the deals in every geography and in different segments in order to, to have no network risk if some part of the, of the, of the relations with the customer is, is contaminated. So there is no risk to see the top customer going uh, out of the door in the next year, next two years, because some parts of, 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 of the contract are isolated from, from the rest. So ju just to put that all together, there's no chance that tomorrow Starbucks could walk away and significantly impair the profitability and revenues that we're seeing from Arista. There's multiple contracts with Starbucks uh, across geographies, across business lines. So maybe one or two contracts may drop off, but never the whole customer. And that hasn't been the case in the past. Do you know what proportion of the cost structure is made up of the volatile commodities? And how do you get comfort over that volatility? That's a very good question. And if talking to, to a competitor, the main, the, main, the main idea is, look, we, you cannot control how commodities will move in the short term. In fact, you have two different segments. The more commodity segment, breadth segment, which is 40% of the revenue, you have the more specialized value-added segment, which is 60%, and you have capacity of increased prices in the more value-added, where, where at least it has 60%. So if you look at the long-term viability and, and EBITDA margin structure of this industry, you'll see that even the best competitor cannot hold a 15% EBITDA margin for a long period because it, it's not going to be stable. It's going to be choppy because of those movements in, the, in commodity prices. So again, 40%, you cannot pass in the short term those price increases, 60%, you, you somewhat can. So. I just want to add to that, I think, um, well, there are a few players and, and globally that can um, provide high quality, consistent B2B bakery, frozen bakery at a scale that's compar comparable to Arista, and it has presence globally. So there's some sort of diversification benefit in a way that if that, uh, say, if a flour prices double in Europe in between 2014 and 16, but then there are other regions who um, we are benefiting from, say, favorable, favorable um, currency impacts, for example. So there are some diversif diversification benefit that's taken into effect. I'll add a little bit. and. Kind of that um, moat that we were talking about earlier is that Arista makes sure to do R&D combined efforts with their customers, so that does create a little bit of space. So even if they're on the wrong, slightly wrong side of a commodity pricing, they are working on specific uh, to the order uh, R&D research. So for example, if Starbucks want a very specific item, Arista will go half and half on working with them to develop that. So that creates long-term contracts that tie the two companies together and creates a little bit of protection for the company. In your uh, diligence, when you talk to the McDonald's client, it sounds like uh, they feel McDonald's has a lot of leverage over um, these contracts. Do you have a sense of how margins have held up over time and um, you know, what, what's the risk of those continuing to, to grind down? Well, if you look at the past history of the company, you'll see that this contract, we don't know exactly because they didn't want to disclose those items to us, but our feeling is that it is a symbiotic relationship between them, even though McDonald's is way bigger and is, you know, has probably more leverage in order to negotiate. But our feeling is that uh, these contracts should be yielding somewhat close to 12% EBITDA, because of the historical performance, and now the company as an overall is making 9%. So we feel that we have upside in our, in our case. We, we don't feel that uh, these, these contracts are, are a problem for, for our, our thesis. So we are pretty comfortable with that. They, they definitely do have leverage, but even historically, if we looked at historis, uh, Arista's historicals, we're much lower uh, in terms of margin than we've ever been before due to that B2C uh, entrance, which they're now pulling out of, so they want to get back to their core of B2B. Uh, and also looking at competitors, they're all in that higher uh, 11 plus percent margin space, as well as they, speaking with Euro Pastry, the largest competitor, 
um, they expect ARISTA margins to, to get back into that 13, 15%, which is what they consider the healthy region. Um, so from our perspective, we think that really uh, margins can, are really headed in one direction, and that's all. Also, I would like to add on to that point, like, as you said, it's a low margin business which Arista is in. So it's a good, good thing and bad thing because bad thing because we don't earn high, much higher margins. The good thing is we don't have that many competitors in that particular segment with McDonald's, Subway, Starbucks. So even though they have leverage in the scale sense, but as a supplier, they don't have that much bargaining power. Yeah, um, on page 13, you have showing the profitability comparison and their even margin uh, for the most recent comparison is 1%. Um, can mm -hmm. you just explain what's going on there and uh, why that's so low as compared to the other companies? Yeah, sure. Uh, this company is, is, is the result of a failed rollout in this industry. Mm -hmm. So since they acquire a lot of businesses, they have a huge DNA, DNA amount that flows every year through the PNL. But the, cap, the, the gap between DNA and CapEx, maintenance CapEx, is, is huge. So that's why if you go to the PL and you see that, well, EBIT margin is not that good, but the free cash flow generation is, is there. So we're not concerned about that. So most of that is amortization expense? Yeah. 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 Can you talk about, I'm looking at uh, slide eight, just how it's traded historically here and comparing that with your thesis that it could be refinanced and there was yeah. this term sheet offered at some point in 2018 mm -hmm. was that kind of the catalyst behind that run up from the low of 56 and it's kind of hung out there for the time being you're just going to walk through why you think it's trading the way it is and presumably if this term sheet was offered um, maybe why you think other people aren't latching onto that idea that it's well in excess of the tranche size of this so yeah you know why still the disconnect well uh this company, the problems started in 2017 uh, because the company ca came from 2.5 billion in net debt, assuming the, the sub debt, to with 600 million net debt, and, and they tapped into the B2C segment. And talking to, to, to Europastry, the main competitor in Europe, they actually did the opposite because they didn't want to jeopardize their relationships with, with clients. They sold the B2C segment to a smaller PEs, and they focus on, on the B2B part of the business. This company did the opposite, and that's the biggest catalyst of the whole failure from the period 2010, 2014. So this company went from 600 to 300 million run rate EBITDA, and the note, these notes traded back to, to 80, 80 cents on the dollar. Back in the summer of 2018, the company went through a tremendous stressful period because there were a lot of rumors. The biggest shareholder wanted to, to raise capital, but not enough capital to cover the whole necessities of Arista. And Gary McGann, the CEO, went out and said, look, either we raise at $100 million, at 100 million euros, sorry, or there's no deal. This company cannot survive. And he imposed what he thought about the company over the shareholders. And he raised at 100 million. So this, this, this price movement is specifically that stressful period. So when they executed that equity raise, those notes went from 56 to 90s in three, four months. And that term sheet was thrown on the table here before the equity raise because the creditors, the big fixed income house that we don't know who was, uh, wanted to take that position in the company. They were very comfortable. That was a uh, 1.2 billion euros uh, loan unsecured at a 4.5% rate. And the company was leveraged seven plus times at that time. So we are pretty comfortable that, and, well, sorry. And here, what happened is that they went from 90 to 75 because the company announced that they will not be paying the coupons. So this whole creditor base, they felt that they, they should, they, we are seeing a, a replacement in the in the shareholder, in the in the creditor base. Uh, yeah, but regardless, to give a little bit of the backstory, it's yeah. these uh, Arista was rolling up a ton of smaller B two C companies, buying them on debt, 
and then not effectively bringing them into the fold of the company, not creating any synergies. They were sitting out. And so when one year would pass roughly and the owners of those previously small companies would leave, suddenly those, uh, those would become orphaned companies and that led to the massive drop off uh, in margins and as well as the difficulty that we're facing here. To combat that, they're essentially selling off all these non-core assets and creating, uh, going back more to their core B2B, going back to what they've previously done at an extremely high level. So this, this may be my fault for not understanding against the against that timeline, taking on the evolution of the liability side of the balance sheet, but so the capital that they were going to raise in debt form from this large fixing mass manager, the use of proceeds for that was originally contemplated to take out these preps. Is that yeah? So it, it was to um, to clear out the whole the whole uh, liability side of the balance sheet and become the large, the essentially the debt holder for our stuff. So there was a time when that was on the table. And thinking about again, your thesis is very much that evolution of of the liability stack. You also mentioned there's a covenant consideration. Can you just walk through the ability for them to still affect that kind of transaction and does this covenant now create some kind of issue and hence maybe that suggests the discounted price as well? Sure. Yeah. So uh, first, first of all, um, the, the, the share, the equity holders, uh, so they raise, they raise money in the equity uh, raising that we talked about, but those equity holders cannot receive any dividends until our bonds are paid off, including um, the coupons that have been held aside. So we feel comfortable because of that 800 uh, million raise, there's a lot of pressure from those equity holders to, to get dividends, they want their money. So we're ahead of them. So in, in every way we're protected in that front, um, which we feel strongly about. Right, and then I guess I'm just saying the ability for them to now come back and address this issue that the shareholders clearly want to address. Mm -hmm. Does the covenant allow them to? Can they issue new secured debt despite mm -hmm. the fact they have this maintenance covenant that seems to be declining over time? Yeah, so that ties up to our second option. Actually, our second option, we are um, considering refinancing basically the entire capital structure. And so, um, in the, in the first uh, option, there is concern that there's um, the company may not be able to um, create senior security ahead of those senior bank uh, debt. So the second option is actually to um, refinance the entire liability uh, debt, um, including the senior unsecured debt. What, what, Belinda, what we see is banks going secured and these this fixed income funds getting the unsecured tranche to wipe out and clean the hybrid portion. We are about the time. Do you have any final questions? Yeah, I just had one. Um, yeah. is, is the term loan investable institutionally? Two years ago, when this, this event happened, I know that there was a lot of hedge funds targeting this Schulstein, which are basically uh, local German unsecured debt given by, by German banks. And some other hedge funds, bigger hedge funds, trying to target the, their general loans. I don't know how feasible it is, but I, 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 I hope that, that, that you can invest in those. But, but returns are lower, so. Yeah, I just wondering if you give any relative value consideration to moving up in the cap, cap structure versus well, being down those, with hybrids. Those unsecured loans uh, are giving 1.7% rate. Yeah. And, and, and the perks are giving a total of 4.7%. So you have a huge additional cost in the terms of subordination. Great, well everyone, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, my name is Mattia and I have with me Maria and Shashi. We are Team Omega and we're going to present our investment ideas, which is a bond issued by Peabody Energy. This is the agenda we're going to cover. Um, there is a recommendation first, then we're going to walk through a business overview, the investment thesis, the valuation, and the risks. The recommendation first, our recommendation is to buy Peabody 6% 2022 at a price, current price of 96, which gives a yield of 7.9%. This is a senior secured bonds, it's the most senior part of the Peabody capital structure. 
uh, we believe that the market is misjudging the risk of this, um, of this bond. Uh, we think it's way less risky than the market is pricing. And we believe the fair value is more than 100 basis points tighter than uh, where it's trading right now. Uh, our investment thesis uh, is made of four points. They support our investment recommendation. Point number one is Peabody is a very highly cash generative business, even at low cash, uh, low core prices. Point number two is um, low leverage. Peabody is really low leveraged at the moment. Point number three is the um, liquidity. Uh, Peabody has a very high liquidity on balance sheet at through a revolver. Point number four is we believe that management is going to tender these bonds at a premium of three to four points from where they're trading now. Next, we move to the business overview. So talking about Peabody, Peabody is the biggest U.S. coal company and all of its assets are on safe developed jurisdictions, meaning the U.S. and Australia. 92% of its reserves are from thermal coal, and with the current proven and probable reserves, they have a life of mine of over 20 years. 48% of their revenues come from the US and 37% from Asia. They have contracts over many years until 2025, but for the next current year, they have 75% of the vol volumes committed and 65% of it priced. We do understand that the coal industry is going through some pressures, especially from the cleaner energy side, but we think that the slowdown in volumes will occur over many decades, and our bond has a maturity of 2022. So we believe that despite the shift in demand, with China decreasing their demand and India increasing, that won't be relevant for our investment thesis. And just to clarify, Nowadays, about 30% of the global world energy consumption is still based on coal, so that won't change overnight and won't change until 2022. Recapping our investment thesis, the company is highly cash generative, it has low leverage, it has ample liquidity with a revolver facility, and has the option of the tender or consent fee. Um, let's go a little bit more in details in each one of those points in the investment thesis. So the point number one, I want you to look at the chart at the bottom. This is the free cash flow generation that Peabody had over the seven quarters. Uh, as you can see, for each quarter, interest payments is 35 million, and the free cash flow they were able to generate varies between 560 million, covering interest payment almost 16 times, to 120 million, covering interest payment uh, three and a half times, which is a very, very um, ample type of uh, coverage. Um, so they generate a lot of cash. On top of that, they're running a CapEx program at the moment, which is $325 million. They can go down to $200 million, uh, where is, uh, which is maintenance CapEx, essentially. So they have further um, levers that they can use to increase uh, cash production if they want. Point number two is the leverage. This company at the moment is levered only 0.7 times EBITDA, which is really low. That means that if market um, goes through a tough period, they can, they can stretch that balance sheet a little bit without any issue. The covenant they have says they need to stay below two times levered, um, and they are far, far away from it. So they, they will stay well within the covenants of the bonds. Point number three is the liquidity. So if you look at the chart down here, they have a cash on balance sheet of $800 million and a revolver facility uh, maturing in 2023 of other $540 million. Uh, the first, first big repayment is in 2022, which is our bond, uh, which is $500 million. It's very easily covered by the cash balance and the revolver facilities. Uh, so we don't have any repayment before us, uh, and the cash pile is so big, they easily cover that repayment, even in case they burn some cash. And again, they're not burning cash, they're not even close to burning cash. Point number four is the upside that we see as the management is going to tender the bonds. Uh, we think they're going to tender the bonds because uh, Peabody agreed to a joint venture with Archcoal. For the joint venture to go through, they need to move some assets to the joint venture entity. And the covenants of the bond do not allow that to happen. So the only way management can do this is to tender the bonds or pay a constant fee and change the docs, essentially, to allow the joint venture to be formed and to be created. We believe the upside from this in terms of premium for the tender or the constant fee is three to four points. That adds to the, uh, to the value of our bonds. Next, we move to valuation with Shashi. 
Uh, talking about the valuation, so uh, given the strong historical credit metrics and the performance of the company, we are quite confident uh, and that's what's driving our confidence in our base case. Uh, our base case, we believe, is fairly conservative. Uh, uh, you know, compared to the where the where the market projects it currently to be. Just to reiterate on the base case key assumptions, uh, we've assumed five percent degrowth in in revenues. Uh, we've assumed a spot price case, but the volume is by five percent. We projected uh, EBITDA margins to remain stable. However, we also projected a higher one billion dollar of capex for the next uh, three years uh, and sixteen percent dividend payout. You know, so if if we actually project and our bond kind of matures in CY twenty two. Uh, we can see that the company is generating strong cash flow and the debt covenants are fairly under control in our base case, which we again, to reiterate, it's, it's a fairly conservative case. So interest coverage is over four times in our base case. However, we also understand given the current coal market conditions, we need to test the strong the, the financial performance of the company uh, in a break case scenario. So what we have tried to do is we've, we've created a break case, so we've dropped the coal prices by another 30% over next three years. That's on top of the 35% drop in coal prices uh, year to date what has happened. So if you see in that scenario, you know, stress tested revenue and EBITDA generation, we have no cash flow generation uh, in CY22 when the bond matures. However, we still feel that, you know, the debt covenants are kind of on the edge, but under control. So we have an interest coverage of over two times in that scenario. Talking about the IRR, so we have created multiple scenarios to calculate the IRR. Uh, in our in our base investment strategy, we recommend holding the bond till maturity in 2022. Uh, we project a base IRR of 7.9%. Uh, we've also created three different scenarios, uh, which we believe could be an opportunistic trade in one year. Uh, one is if significant improvement in the industry happens, we believe the bond prices would go up and we could end up earning an IRR between 9 to 12%. Uh, scenario two and three is basis what the arch called JV uh, Madhya talked about. So we believe. Uh, if that goes through, there could be a tender or consent fee opportunity and we could earn a 3 to 4 points premium on that and we could end up making a 9 to 10 percent IRR on that. So moving on to the risk, uh, we believe there are fundamentally three risks in the business. Uh, the aggressive financial policy uh, you know, of equity distribution opted by the company. Uh, the second is the coal market downturn. So we, we understand the coal market is challenged right now. However, and if if it, you know, shit were, were to hit the fan, then probably this is a big risk. But we believe the management is fully aware of the challenges and have taken ample measures and the balance sheet is strong enough to handle that. Uh, third is the ESG risk. Given Peabody is a coal mining company, we believe for any coal, coal mining player, ESG is kind of a, is an area where, which is coming up. But uh, given that, you know, strong competitive positioning of the company and the awareness of the, the management and, you know, focus on ESG, we believe they are well equipped to handle that. So just to sum it up, uh, we strongly recommend Peabody 2022 6%, given the strong cash flow generation of the company, the balance sheet strength, and the current positioning of, of the bond vis-a-vis -vis its risk profile. Thank you. And we will now open to questions. So do you mind filling in some points on the history here? So they attempted to do this already, right? And you, you, meant, you, you the, talked about the tenor, the tenor, yes. 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 Um, and they pulled it. Yes. So, again, I was more on the periphery of it. So, just do you mind filling in the blank as to why this time round yep. is the appropriate time, what happened, and why it couldn't get done? The yep. First time? Uh, there was actually an analyst on the Q3 call that asked exactly that question. It's like, what you guys are going to do with these bonds? Uh, because, I mean, you tried to do that because you need to do that, but you didn't manage to do it. So, what's going to change? Um, so what we think they're going to do, they're going to do two things. First, they're going to try again, because that's the only thing they can really do. Uh, and second of all, before trying again, they're becoming more credit friendly. So that's another thing that we believe is happening right now with this company and management. So they realized that when they announced this thing, um, the tender kind of worked, but the refinancing didn't work. So if the refinancing doesn't work, you cannot tender the bonds, uh, essentially. Uh, so what they did, and this is the comment over here, um, so they understood that, um, and they changed the guidance for gross leverage. So they say, you know what? We had a target between 1.4 billion and 1.2 billion of gross leverage. Now we want to go below. We want to go to the lower bound, 1.2 billion. They, they're becoming more credit friendly in that sense. So when they announce this thing again, uh, maybe with higher premium, the thing will go through. Um, so we believe they will try again within 12 months, and they will succeed. Of course, they will need to find the right window. Um, to do that, but I think that that's one thing that we'll try to do. 
Second thing they can do, instead of trying to refinance the entire 1.4 billion with another 1.4 billion of debt, they can uh, reduce the issue size and use some of the cash on balance sheet to uh, partially refinance, well, to, to use to refinance sort of the, the, the gap that is missed. And do they have access to the capital markets? Now I remember they, right, the refinancing didn't work. I think the bonds, and I don't know if you have it in the deck, the rest of the capital structure? Uh, the yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, that it's, it's a very simple capital structure. Um, they have essentially three debt securities. Where did the 25s trade? Uh, they were trading at 85, so 85, 87. So right now, you're right, they don't have right now the access to the, to the capital markets to refinance the entire thing. When they try to do the refinancing, they were trying with a thermal loan, 900 million, and an unsecured bond, 500 million. Uh, it's not clear to us which one of the two parts didn't really work. Um, our understanding is probably the loan, which was too big, 900 million, to get, uh, you know, to get, to get done uh, in that size at attractive levels. So one thing they could do again is come with a smaller amount instead of 900 million, they reduce it to 200 million smaller. Um, and instead of unsecured bonds, they do another secured bonds with different covenants, and they use some of the, bond, of the cash they have on balance sheets rather than refinancing the entire 1.4 billion. Yeah, as far as the covenant, um, I know financial leverage of 0.7 is relatively low, but I think the covenant at two times kind of reflects what people are comfortable with. Yeah. Um, do you know how much leverage would increase if, for example, coal prices fell 50%? Like, yeah. how big of a cushion do you have before you go up against that covenant? Yeah. So. Um, Shashi in the model run this stress scenario, uh, which is here, um, and um, Shashi, you know this. So, um, yeah. so, so we've kind of tested, you know, what are the levels which we can hit. So we've assumed, uh, so already the coal prices have dropped by 35% year to date. If you further drop the coal prices to 30% uh, lower, which is the lowest level that has hit in the last decade, uh, and we also contract the EBITDA margins from 17% to 12%. Uh, we achieve a, so we kind of hit the break-even case where we're not making any free cash flow post and trust in CY22. Uh, and at that current level, we know leverage would reach around two times in, in 22 is what we, we believe. Which is the covenant, level. And a point I think it's worth mentioning is that coal prices should drop and stay there for a while. So it's not just touching this low level, but staying for many quarters to the point that they stop, but they stop generating cash and start burning. So just to be clear, if, if the same thing they happened in 2015, 16 happens again, and the coal price stays there for three quarters, uh, we believe this company is going to be fine. Um, if it stays there for longer, then of course become an issue. But we're talking about a level that was touched once in a, in a decade, and we're saying that it's going to be it's happening again within the next two and a half years, and it's going to stay there for more than three quarters. So that would be an extremely stressed scenario. Do they need to get, if they were to do some sort of a, an amendment, um, do they need to get consent from the 25s as well? Yeah, they need okay. the consent from the 25s and 22s in different proportions. Um, I think they just need about 50% of the 25s, uh, while they need two thirds of the 22s. This, I think this company filed for bankruptcy uh, a number of, a couple of years ago. It, is this the cap structure that emerged out of the bankruptcy? Yeah, correct. Day, uh, day it's, one? Uh, it's not exactly the same. They had uh, another term loan that they had paid. So there was a billion of bonds and a billion of, not a billion, 900 million of term loans. Now there is a billion of bonds and 400 million of term loans. So they pay 500 million of term loans. But this is exactly the same thing. And that's the reason why the covenants are so strict on this thing. Because of course, when you renegotiate after a chapter 11 thing, um, your covenants most likely will be extremely restricted for management. So from the restructuring, the um, senior creditors basically took the equity in the new company. Right. Are they still primarily the equity holders in 
um, company I, I, was that turned over? I, I think we don't believe that's the case right now. I, we don't believe that it's the same. We, we're not fully sure because the only data we have is the data we get from Bloomberg, Bloomberg in terms of uh, shareholder kind of registry. Um, and it doesn't seem like they're the same, at least not in the same uh, proportion. And sorry to ask the question again yeah. this time around, but um, on the dividends? Yeah. You know, and the stock buybacks. Yes. I mean, how wedded is management to those payments, and are are they willing to cut them to zero? So, in order to service that. Yeah, that's that's the tricky part, and that's why we put that in the, in our uh, in our risks. So, management this year already said that they're going to distribute more than 100 percent of the free cash flows. Um, so that means that the cash balance end of this year will be a little bit lower than right. it was the beginning. It was 800 million at the beginning, it's going to end up 750 or a little bit below 750. Now, managers are also aware that they cannot do that, and they said today in the, in the conference call that this is this year because it was already kind of guided, okay. uh, but they cannot do that keep going forward if they don't, uh, you know, if they don't create those free cash flows. Um, and they've been really good in, in meeting guidance in terms of gross debt and cash balances. So they have this guidance of 1.2, 1.4 billion gross debt. Mm -hmm. They always stay uh, within within those limits, which is the graph up there. They always stay there. Um, it's going to be a tough call, uh, but we believe they will cut the shares by them mm -hmm. if that comes to that. Perhaps, just to clarify, the share buyback program still has 140 million to go this year, and the dividend payments this year were 250 million, but the year before they were 60 million. So the normal pace of dividends is 15 million each quarter. So the revolver matures in 2023. Um, you know, I think you're reading a lot about um, and, and are seeing banks getting out of the business of lending money to coal companies. So I would gather maybe a risk of the 22s and 25s is that they, you know, they, they might extend and then they have this issue in 2023, you know, potentially a refinancing a credit facility, although it's not used today could be somewhat drawn by that. Is that something you think about? Or? Yeah, so we believe they actually have a very good relationship with banks, surprisingly, maybe. Uh, they refinanced this revolver two months ago, um, which means even at this, with this call environment, they managed to have access to banks to such an extent that not only increased the, the size of the revolver, they also extended it in materials, which to us was like a good sign, because it's like this guy is able to refinance this revolver and increasing uh, the size and extending the maturity with this call environment, which means to us that the relationship with, that with banks, they, surely they're not bad, uh, but most likely they're, they're kind of, uh, they have good relationship with the banks. Does the facility provide any junior lien capacity? So, I, um, we, to be fair, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the docs on the revolver. Um, we have not seen it, um, so I'm not sure if, if it's available or not. Is that leverage covenant, though, part of the credit agreement? I know you said you're not familiar with yes. the document, but that's where the uh, Of the revolver, I'm not familiar. Uh, while the bonds, we've seen the, the prospectus. That's uh, where the 2x is? Yes, correct. So we don't know if there's something more restricted, potentially? On the revolver. On the revolver, yes. Side. Okay. What's the covenant or provision in the notes that do not allow them to contribute assets to a JV? Yeah, so they have um, um, a covenant that says you can only strip assets if you get paid in cash, and you need to use that cash to repay the debt in case you do that. Um, there is a covenant line in the prospectus. Um, so our understanding of it is that they could move the, the asset to the joint venture, but the joint venture should pay them some cash. Uh, and that would be structured as an asset sale, you're saying? Yes, if in case they want to do that. Now. The joint venture is 66% owned by Peabody. It would be Peabody buying uh, an asset from themselves and paying themselves. So I'm not sure how that would work, legally speaking. Um, but um, from the legal side of things, we're not extremely familiar with how that could be structured. What we know is that management uh, has not been able to fully agree the joint, I mean, they agreed, but they're not fully completed because of these bonds. Is there a shot clock on that? Do they have to contribute the asset by a certain point? And then the JV partner has the option to walk? Or um, What we know about the joint venture is um, that the, the structure is essentially 
this one. Uh, so 66% Peabody, 33% Archcall. Peabody is going to operate the joint venture. We don't know if Archcall or Peabody can walk away from this. Um, so we don't know if that's the case. Uh, this is not being completed yet, of yeah, course. It's still evolving. Yeah. They need approval from uh, DOJ, and they need approval from the bondholders. Do you know how much uh, EBITDA those assets would generate, like what the pro forma leverage would look like? Yeah, uh, we, did, we didn't manage to find that. Uh, it's seven mines involved, four from Peabody um, and three from Archcode. We didn't find, we didn't manage to find uh, what, how big the, the EBITDA from those mines would be. Mm -hmm. So the, the point is that uh, Peabody has 12% of market share in the coal market and Arch has 4%. So it would be two very relevant companies getting together and the management has guide for synergies of 120 million, which we take with a grain of salt. They might be too optimistic, but seems that it's a good business for them due to the geography location of the mines and uh, some synergies from logistics and infrastructure. We are about the time. Do you have any final questions for the team? Yeah, well, just one final thing. So, um, the, the investment thesis, as you're proposing, it seems to be very much more of this temporal seniority, um, tactical sort of trade. The question is, do you actually like the assets here? If this doesn't work out and you are forced to, well, you'll see the bond price decline. Clearly, there's a steepness to that curve. The 25s are pricing in some sort of asset quality impairment. Do you want to own it? Do you want to add more to this if that happens? Yeah. So I guess the answer to that is one, we chose the 22s because we have this liquidity cushion and the revolver covering the maturity that, in a way, let us not be extremely bullish about the assets and still buying the bonds. Okay. Second, um, especially the um, US assets, they managed to run those assets with a minimal capex and uh, keeping uh, the cash cost uh, of producing coal very low and even decreasing in some mines. So despite it could be a challenge market, as uh, Maria said, uh, we still believe that the asset there, they know how to run them, and they've been able to run them with low capex. So we, we believe that the company is run in a good way, despite the, the market. And just to add, we, we do understand that the coal market itself is diminishing, you know, and it's going to diminish it further. But we also want to reiterate that it's not an overnight process that's going to happen. So it's, it's a two or three decade process or by 2040 and 50, the market will diminish and other resources will come up. So you need a player which has a strong competitive positioning, has good assets, and to be able to withstand that and you know, towards the end, so it, it's gonna survive for another 20, 30 years and we believe Peabody is a player uh, which can survive that and kind of leave the benefits out of it. Thank you, team, I'll make Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.